the scale of our impact on the planet is so vast now, right, that the natural systems can't kind of absorb all of our bad behavior in the way that they, you know, were kind of able to for a while. That's a lot of pressure. It and is a lot it's, of pressure. it's a lot to expect yeah. out of some primates. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I think that definitely cooperation is the single most important thing because, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of destructive possibility you're dealing with, the human factor is going to be super important. Are we? Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast, a very special episode. Um, You may have seen the first of this new series that will be eventually rebranded and uh, re-kind of edited for something that working title is Casual Courses. Maybe you guys have a better name for it. And kind of the premise being um, I've, I've reached out to a bunch of my favorite past guests from this show um, and to see if they have any current uh, projects like a a class that they're putting together or a book that they're brainstorming or maybe just finishing or something like that and see if they want to come on the show and through uh, the course of multiple episodes kind of hash out and and work through some of the uh, uh, kind of showing you guys the early phases of some of those processes before the finished product, giving you a chance to ask questions and get feedback from you, and then just giving us an opportunity to have a casual conversation um, about the work. Also, without, without the pressure of the academic needing to know exactly the citation for this and that, which is what a finished product uh, would have. So just a little more freedom, a little more casual, a little more fun. And so that's what this is. This is the second episode. And so this may be a part that will then like cut in the finished product and start now. Uh, So joining me again today is my fantastic guest, Athena Actippus, is joining me. Thank you so much. Hey, Shane. It's so awesome to be here. I always love talking to you about my work. And how is the book coming along? It is coming along. So I have basically a draft of everything, but there are lots of holes and lots of things I need to move around and lots of things I need to figure out how to communicate better. So... Mm. I was hoping you could help me figure out what to do. <laughs> Absolutely. So we kind of did the bird's eye view already. We did the overview of everything the book is about, which if if you give people the elevator pitch to get uh, everyone yeah. up. To so speed. the book um, working title is Everything is Fine, How to Thrive in the Apocalypse. And the whole idea of the book is that you know, everything is fine in the sense that if we deal with the apocalypse that we're currently in, if we work together, if we cooperate, um, and also if we kind of, you know, look at ourselves as humans and our skills, our abilities, um, and really leverage those to deal with the apocalyptic situation that we're in, then everything can be fine. And saying everything and fine does everything is fine doesn't have to be like ironic. Yeah. So that's the that's the idea. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's like yeah, the, these these things might seem challenging. There's massive volcanoes and earthquakes that that have always happened and could happen any time. And and there's but now there's increased climate issues with hurricanes, threats of uh, nuclear holocausts, and thing, things like that 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 could happen. But no big deal. All we need to do is get. 7 billion people or so to all work together and unify with a collective (laughs) goal and it should be just easy peasy. That's that's the idea. Uh, There may be a few more details to it than that, but uh, that's what I try to get to by the end of the book. So (laughs) yeah, well, it's, it's, it's so awesome. And I mentioned this in the first episode that, that, that 
obviously what a fun way to communicate cool science ideas to you and I obviously love blabbing about science all of the time, but hooking yeah. the public in, uh, mm -hmm. uh, what a what a fun way to engage with the public by uh, talking about these apocalyptic scenarios that obviously are very popular and in and, um, and television and, and fiction and people love just looking through history and hearing about uh, uh, the many times through history that that things have really gone to hell. Yeah, well, and, you know, a lot of places in the world are pretty apocalyptic right now, too. Mm. So, you know, we're pretty lucky that we're able to you know, live a privileged life where we're not worried about, you know, being safe and having food and our loved ones being OK. Right. But that's not how it is all over the world. So privileged. I wasn't even considering that as we're sitting here <laughs> at uh, Arizona State University in on a lovely day mm -hmm. in this wonderful office. Like I'm like, oh, you know, I feel like this office could be maybe be a little bigger or whatever. <laughs> I like it. the climate controlled and everything. Mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. grabbed a nice breakfast on the way over and, mm -hmm. and I was sitting here like, what would we do if there's an apocalyptic scenario? And just completely forgot lots of people all around the world facing these uh, types of crises every every single day. Yeah. Yeah. So. Part of it is, you know, that expanding our scope, the scale at which we're thinking about things, both in terms of time, right? Thinking that in the history of humans, we've encountered apocalypses throughout our evolutionary history, right? So that's going to affect our ability to deal with apocalypses. Mm -hmm. So there's that piece. And then there's this sort of spatial scale, you know, looking at, well, how are things different now than they were in ancestral times in terms of the massive level of you know both how many humans there are and how much integration we have how complex the problems are because of that uh, but also you know, how can we then take what we know from the science of both sort of evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology and then also cooperation science to better deal with the current massive clusterfuck apocalypse that you know, we're we're kind of I, I wouldn't say we're in the middle of a clusterfuck apocalypse, but there's certainly like things to suggest that we're approaching just the this like level of wicked problems that are so entwined mm. that can become really, really hard to to deal with them with any of the mechanisms that we have already. So that's kind of where things go at the end of the book. Cool. Yeah. So that's where we'll get to. That's now we, now we have to. a vision of, of the yeah. path forward yeah. uh, into the cluster apocalypse. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> trademark. <laughs> um, so uh, so great. Well, part one. What, what is part one about? Yeah. So the first part is really looking at our our evolutionary history of of dealing with apocalyptic situations and also where we are. Oh, where we are. Here we are. Um, mm. Sorry. With uh, <laughs> our um, our ability is to, to deal with current crises and things. So how are our brains actually adapted to deal with things that are challenging? What is, you know, how, how can we from having a better understanding of our body's responses um, to stress and our our evolutionary history of really you know dealing with stressful, massively catastrophic situations, then be in a better position to deal with what we're dealing with today. Mm. So it's, it's like your brain on the apocalypse kind of. Mm. Well, so this may not be stuff in your book. It's just something that's already coming yeah, to yeah. mind for me, um, which is this this idea we were just um, – I, I mentioned Robert Sapolsky just bef be yeah. before this recording, as I often do because yeah. he's my favorite scientist. <laughs> but he, he does a lot of stress-related stuff and, and yeah. kind of um, – tries to popularize this idea that that uh there's like there's a bit of this mitch mass mitch 
Mis- uh, mis- mis- mismatch yeah. theory yeah. in in some yeah. ways of of um it, our our stress responses being kind of the same that just about any mammal has and they're a little more adapted for short acute stressors of say predator prey situations where you have this very acute uh, situation where you either need to capture prey or get away from a predator and and it really functions quite well in that context but then you expand that into humans ability to think so far into the future and Mm -hmm. and have those same stress responses about their 401k or or something like that and that yeah. and that's when it now becomes perhaps a little bit more maladaptive because of the chronic state of of the stress response not uh not getting back to that homeostasis mm-hmm. of of the kind of relaxed there's not an actual acute threat here at this moment because we're just bombarded with endless ideas of potential acute threats yeah. so in that way do you think that there are situations that that um like a little bit of of threat and real problems once in a while in in a person's life maybe helps dial in some of that like almost almost allergic response that many of us are having yeah so one of the things that i've been trying to develop um, in this first half of the book is really talking about signal detection theory in relation Mm. to, you know, our stress response and how we detect threats or not, and then how we respond to, you know, potential catastrophic risks, um, whether it's something immediate that's happening like a natural disaster or something that might happen in the future. So, you know, the basic idea of signal detection theory is that, if you're trying to figure out if there's a, a threat out there, so sort of one of the classic examples is, you know, on with a radar screen, you're trying to figure out, is this an, an incoming missile or is this a goose? And <laughs> the fact is, um, you know, what you're dealing with on a radar screen is just like these, you know, greeny blobs of things, right? So it can be hard to, to tell, is this a missile or is it a goose? But if you make a mistake... Um, the effects could be catastrophic. So the yeah, you you there's the kind of error management of of is uh, if you think it's a goose, but it's actually a missile, you're a goner. Yeah. If you think it's a missile and it's actually a, a goose, now you've just launched a missile into the sky. <laughs> exactly, like a world-ending yeah. mistake potentially. So. And the problem is, you know, if all you have is the information on the radar screen, um, you could have the same blob that could be a missile or it could be a goose. So basically, a lot of times all you have are goose aisles, like in terms of the actual information that you're looking at. So you're either going to be making one mistake or the other for a certain proportion of the stimuli that you're dealing with. Um, Now, that means if you want to get better at detecting, you need to add more information. You need to, you know, maybe have a heat sensor too because the, you know, goose isn't going to be flaming hot, hopefully. Um, so you can, you know, add these other cues, add this you know, additional information to better distinguish the signal from the noise or the missile from the goose, right? So um, that's one of the challenges that, you know, we have. Um, and we've done a pretty good job, you know, at sort of building our cognitive abilities to do that. You know, well, evolution has, you know, selected us to to do that. You know, we incorporate multiple cues. But the fact is, if a threat is really dramatic and missing a threat could be lethal, then there's going to be a little bit of a bias to um, make the mistakes of sort of over-detecting the threats. Because if you miss one, then you die. So that makes it, uh, you know, a little bit, a little bit tricky to figure out how do you, you know, set the threshold right, especially if you have very limited information. 
Goose or missile is my new life mantra. Awesome. And just as I walk yeah. through <laughs> my existence each day, I'm just going to be like, every time something pings me, I'm just yeah. going to go, goose or missile. Yeah. Goose or missile. Absolutely. And, and what about uh, what about kind of the... the um, and, and and stop me if I'm like maybe yeah. getting ahead of of, of things. This is yeah, but maybe steer can, the ship. Because I can return actually, come back to the point that you were asking about like allergic reactions potentially, right? Yeah. So so with this, you know, because a lot of things are goose aisles and there's this ambiguity, um, then that means that as we're taking in information in the world, you're like, okay, you know, some geese, some missiles, some things I don't know. Um, you, you actually shift your your threshold kind of based on what's coming in and to your sensory system. So it, it could very well be that, you know, if you are encountering real adversity, that that shifts your detection threshold for missiles versus, you know, so, you know, if you're living a really, you know, privileged life, everything's very easy. Stock market takes a turn. Your 401k, you know, now instead of having $7 million, you only have $4.5 million. Right? Oh, no. Yeah. Exactly. Then that's like, that's a missile. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if, if you're uh, every day, you know, out there trying to, you know, help people. Uh, people who are, you know, dealing with uh, experiencing homelessness and that happens to you, then maybe you'd be like, all right, mm. because you have a better sense of, you know, what the challenges are that people are facing in the world. Or mm. if you um, are living in an area where there's wildfire threat, for example, and you have to evacuate your house to get away from the wildfire, that's that might shift your thresholds a little bit. So some things that might have stressed you out the week before aren't going to stress you out after you experience that because it shifts your threshold. Now, I'm not saying we should all like go out and, you know, seek out experiences that could, you know, be difficult or catastrophic um, just to reset our thresholds. But I think it is, it you know, it is a potentially a lever that we could use to, to de-stress ourselves. And, you know, and we know that like, volunteering when you help when you're helping people like that has a lot of positive effects mm -hmm. on you know making people feel less anxious and stressed and stuff and i don't know i would speculate that that could have something to do with like you realize that maybe you're overreacting to some of your own problems because you see that there's genuine need out there that is you know more important than what you know whatever small things are going on in your life that are stressing you out. Right. I, yeah, that's, um, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's such a good, um, uh, idea and point. I, I also wonder in trying to deal in a uh, dial in the, the, um, uh, what's the sensor management? What, what's oh, the name? Signal detection, signal theory. detection yeah. theory. So what about, so we kind of all have the there. There's this idea of uh, like these black swans, where yeah. where there's uh, the things that you know, the things that you don't know, and then the things that you don't know, you don't know. And we all have e even even there. There are things that are unforeseen by maybe every single person on Earth. And then there's just things that a lot of people haven't had the opportunity to learn yet, or right. it's not in there. I'm sure every industry has all sorts of problems that anyone outside of mm -hmm. the industry is completely oblivious uh, to. So it, it, how, how do you kind of inform yourself in the first place of what the real threats in our, our lives are? Because it, and and how do you prepare for the unknown when yeah. now you've dialed in you've you've done this heat sensor but now there is something akin to a, a flaming goose that suddenly yeah, like right. well, I didn't know that was possible where did that come yeah. from it's a, it's a goose aisle in fact <laughs> one of the best things that has come out of working on this chapter so you met Neil Neil Smith yeah he's the illustrator for the book 
Okay. So we, um, we've been chatting about the ideas and one of the things that came out of it is uh, a goose aisle, which uh, yeah, is yeah. a goose with a missile ass, basically. Oh, fun. He's so, so good. Yeah. So I'll, I'll have to share that with you. <laughs> I can't wait to see the, I can't wait to not just read the book, but see the wonderful <laughs> illustrations. He's very talented. Yeah. So what, I mean, say, say, okay, I'm, I, wake up tomorrow um, with amnesia or something. And I go, but I just have this information like, okay, I just want to understand what the threats are in the world mm -hmm. first and know which ones are a real threat and which ones aren't. I mean, how do you, <laughs> like, like what, what kind of shows up on the, you're writing a book about apocalypses. What, what makes the list for what you? What makes the list? Yeah, so, yeah. I, because because yeah. this is a controversial thing in and of itself. It of is. like, what is represented on that list? What's overly represented? What? Uh, yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, so I kind of start with the natural disasters. That's where I kind of begin um, because those are the you know a class of apocalypses that humans have experienced for, for a very long time. So thinking about, you know, things like, you know, earthquakes, hurricanes, volcanoes, wildfires, you know, things that, you know, we as humans have a long history of, of having to grapple with. Uh, but obviously those also have changed the intensity and frequency have changed over historical time both due to things like you know changes in the um tilting of the earth's axis that actually change weather patterns and things like that um as well as you know human behavior that has changed the way our our world functions so sort of kind of begin there grounded more in the natural world um but yes can i stop you there since, since we're doing yeah. natural stuff just had this thought about I, I kind of I kind of like the threat of hurricanes more than say like a mega volcano or an earthquake because hurricanes we, we see this we see this direct relationship of uh, I mean there's always going to be hurricanes no matter but what but we see this human impact on the environment increasing the frequency and intensity of hurricanes. Yeah. And that's troubling and everything, but at the same time, it feels like, hey, maybe we cooperate and there's something we can do to lower the frequency and intensity uh, of hurricanes. It feels like a sense of predictability and control. Mm -hmm. Mega volcano. Oh, my God. Like, I don't know. Where are these volcanoes? When are, is there one around here? Is it about to blow up? That, that to me is... <laughs> a really scary thought. I mean, earthquakes, you you can make better buildings and everything, but all of California sliding into the ocean uh, because of one big event. That Those are the terrifying ones to me. Yeah, the things that where it feels like there's no control that yeah. we have uh, over them happening. Even if we could, you know, be measuring some things to potentially predict when they would happen and have a little bit of advance notice the idea mm -hmm. that we can't really do much to kind of go in there and change the likelihood that's the scary part yeah so what 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 sort of ideas um i, I mean in and what have humans done in the past to manage um you know like the idea of pompeii yeah <laughs> it's just that's horrifying yeah. uh, uh, like what what have humans done in the past to um because that that to me doesn't seem like there was a solution it was just oh, a whole bunch of people got wiped out that people far enough away didn't yeah well there certainly are you know a set of disasters where there is just going to be a massive amount of death and destruction mm. even even if there's some warning, usually, you know, like, especially in more historical times, there weren't the detection systems that we have today, right? You couldn't, you know, 
constantly be like looking at, well, what's going on on the Richter scale around here or whatever to see if there's a likely event, an earthquake or volcano. So, so there is, um, there was less ability to monitor the natural world yeah. than we have now. And um, attributing based on those mental models at the time, which is like a, a lot of like uh, what we now view as like superstition or what I was a volcano goes off and yeah. you'd you'd be like did did you do that did I do that who who caused that thing yeah I was cooking rice when that happened Maybe was it the why. rice yeah. it was the, uh, no more cooking rice everybody <laughs> yeah <laughs> which I think I feel like that's still in us uh, <laughs> there is a little bit of that yeah in fact um taboos um they often arise around things you know a situation where there's a huge amount of unpredictability, inability mm. to, you know, control things. So certainly, you know, superstitious thinking and behaviors are connected to our anxiety about the unknown in a, in a way. Okay, so that was natural disasters. Yeah. And then you go into in well, part one. Well, I also want to just say, yeah. even if you can't predict you know, a disaster that's going to happen. Yeah. That doesn't mean that there's nothing you can do ahead of time to better deal with a disaster. So uh, our ancestors and humans today also have social networks and relationships. And, you know, now we have lots of institutions that also help with this, which sort of for later in the book. But having people who you can depend on in a time of need. So you might not know what kind of disaster is going to happen or when it's going to happen. But, you know, hey, if I am in a situation where my house burns down and I don't have a place to stay, I know that you'll let me stay on your couch. Right? You would? If I, yeah. If you had a couch. Yeah. Could, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah okay, sure. Very good. You could stay on my <laughs> yeah. If okay. I had one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this, you know, this idea like that we have – people who we can depend on. Mm -hmm. That is a very general purpose um, buffer against the, you know, vagaries of potential disasters, no matter how unpredictable mm -hmm. they are. And, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that um, that will always solve your problem, but it, can be a very, very big part of keeping communities and the individuals within them um, above sort of a threshold of what they need in order to get through really difficult times um, together. And it's important, you know, to have that community and not just be a sort of lone wolf in an apocalypse because so many things are unpredictable. You don't really know if, you know, all of the other things that you've done to try to protect yourself are going to be worthless in a mm. disaster. So those, you know, human relationships really are kind of the heart of managing risk for, for us humans. Mm. Okay. Um, uh, sort of an introvert. What if you're, which helps in some scenarios, yeah. pandemics. They like, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I have a lot of friends and people love it. So maybe, I, but there's, there's a lot of introverts out there that I'm like, Oh man, now I, not only is the world apocalyptic, now I got to go out there and build a social network <laughs> and do help. just to hedge a bet so I have couches to stay on across the <laughs> across the country. And I'd rather just sit around reading. <laughs> but no, I know I know what you're saying, it, and obviously we're very social. Yeah. Um, well, and, and I don't think you have to be an extrovert to have mm. a really great social network. That's In fact, true. you know, um, I think being introverted often means that, you know, people are more deliberate about the relationships mm. that they're in. Um, and they're, oh, that's true. you know, and they might invest more in specific relationships instead of widely. Um, so, so yeah, I don't think it comes down to like, how many Facebook friends? I certainly wouldn't say that like the number of Facebook friends you have is going to correlate with your ability <laughs> to survive in the apocalypse. So <laughs> right, right, right. Um, it's about the it's about the quality 
of the the friendships um and and you know the just the relationships like do you do you know each other well do you trust each other um do you feel like you have a genuine stake in each other's well-being those are the important questions okay um all right uh, so we had natural disasters and then so 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 then what's the next category because every i mean everything's natural but then there's there's things that are pretty new yeah so there are you know there are a lot of natural disasters that are more intense now because of human activity mm -hmm. more intense more frequent um but we have a whole bunch of other threats now as well right so um there's many unanticipated consequences of technology that we've developed. I mean, I think nuclear um, threat is probably the, you know, most currently relevant and visceral one, right? We have the ability to destroy the earth entirely now. Um, mm -hmm. That's not a capacity that any other organism on earth has to our knowledge it's impressive at the same time <laughs> you know if we do it and then aliens come you know sometimes later they'll, they'll i imagine they'll be like sad that that happened but also like wow they really <laughs> really went for it <laughs> they really they had that amount of technology to blow themselves up not not quite enough uh weren't advanced enough to not blow themselves up but advanced enough to blow themselves up but at the same time right right and, and then uh, well it's also tricky that it's uh, that nuclear is in this uh i mean just because it's the same it's the same word it's the same thing that can also provide all sorts of you know, potential much more green energy and everything else for us. But then everyone's now seen Tr Chernobyl on HBO and like, oh, my God, what a horrifying. And yeah. now no one wants uh, nuclear energy anywhere near them, which could hasten other apocalyptic <laughs> scenarios. Yeah. We, we have a very messy uh, amount of yeah. wicked problems. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, uh, Fermi's paradox came up the other day. Yeah. Which is this idea that... We, we, ju we just got done doing... Uh, tell, tell people about the, yeah. the conference we just the got. Zombie Apocalypse Medicine Meeting, which is a uh, conference that is a combination of sort of science and art and policy and uh, basically are looking at the world through the lens of the zombie apocalypse. So we just got done with three and a half crazy days of shows uh, about um, basically television in the apocalypse, looking at all sorts of all sorts of questions. And we we ended on kind of looking to the future, what's imagined future. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the topics that came up is um, Fermi's paradox, which is basically this idea that, uh, you know, given how unbelievably vast the universe is and how many potentially habitable planets there you know are out there that could at least support the kinds of forms of life that we know of on this earth um and there might be others that can could support different forms of life we also don't know that um it's pretty surprising that we haven't heard from anybody how aren't we swimming in aliens by now yeah that's that's the idea of fermi's paradox yeah. and you know people have proposed various solutions um, to this, one of which is that for a society to be advanced enough to um, be able to be in space, they probably also have the technology to destroy themselves. Mm. And so not only do, you know, does, do, would societies have to get through all these other filters to get to the point of being able to develop that technology, they would have to also not you know, accidentally or intentionally destroy themselves before they, you know, got out into the universe. Yeah, yeah. That seems to be the tricky part. <laughs> it was when Earth was smaller, humans could just go around pushing everything else into extinction. But then we kind of ran out of large mammals and stuff to kill off. And then we're like, uh, we're large mammals. <laughs> Maybe we can go after each other more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and this is one of the big, you know, challenges of that, you know, we face moving into the future is that the the scale of our impact on the planet 
is so vast now, right, that the natural systems can't kind of absorb all of our bad behavior in the way that they, you know, were kind of able to for a while. Yeah, you got 200 humans in some place on Earth, you know, some period of time ago. 200 humans could do their darndest to mess up the world and light an entire forest on fire and drive <laughs> a bunch of buffalo uh, thousands of buffalo off a cliff or like what whatever else and still in the scope of the entire world it would it wouldn't be much of an impact and now it's like if all 7 billion no, human is it 7 billion it's it's like, yeah, yeah. If, if, don't drink water out of the proper containers yeah. <laughs> we're screwed <laughs> and, and yeah that's 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 a lot of pressure it and, and it's, pressure. it's a lot to yeah. expect out of some primates yeah <laughs> you know yeah yeah i mean the the scale and scope of you know cooperation and coordination that we we have to you know, we have to we have to figure out how, like how do we how do we do that at scale? But, but we, I mean, we have trouble even you know getting along in small groups of humans. So so how do we do that? How do we get mm. how do we get on the same page to 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 deal with the the crises that we're facing? That's the, and and the, would you say this is this is probably um probably the the single most important thing for uh, for our survival if if you had to like pick one thing or or at least the thing that we all have the most yeah. control over is like figuring out how to work together May, maybe maybe si- uh, this is where scientific innovations will somehow make some breakthroughs where it's cuz it, the the idea of like behavioral economics came out of this idea like why are these foolish humans not behaving in this robotic way? we've crunched the numbers <laughs> i can show you a spreadsheet of how <laughs> we should all be saving and spending our money obviously why are so many people seemingly everyone doing almost the exact opposite of what this very clear spreadsheet says to do and you could say the same about um uh, about the s- covid for for example of of uh uh it, everyone has different views of how it should be managed or or what trade offs are worth taking or whatever but at the same time um there there's a lot more going on than what objectively an individual could do to protect themselves or whatever and how uh, the human factors that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that definitely cooperation is the single most important thing because, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of destructive possibility you're dealing with. The human factor is going to be super important. Um, And, and I would, I would kind of, break it down a little bit into um, some kind of subtopics within that. So one I think is huge is risk management. And we talked a little bit about, you know, how you can manage some of your risk by having these relationships with other people, right? So um, that's one way that you can manage risk. There's also many other ways that you can manage risk. You can um, do things together. You can cooperate with other people to... um, say, like build a shelter that's going to not fall apart in a hurricane. It's another way you could manage risk. You could try to do that by yourself, but it's going to be easier if you work with other people to, you know, reduce the um, the risk that you're facing by mm. doing that. Um, you, uh, you can also just avoid risk entirely by, you know, not doing things that might cause a problem or not going places where you might be facing risk. So, so that's an option too. There can be costs to completely avoiding risk, but, but, you know, it's an option. Um, And you can also just choose to do things that are, you know, a little less 
risky than than other things. Um, or, you know, if you have two alternatives, you're trying to make a decision of what to do, you can choose the, the less risky thing. But but I think, you know, working together in, you know, to build communities that are managing risk together is really powerful. And it doesn't actually require us to have everything solved on the level of 7 billion people. Um, I think, you know, if people feel empowered about looking at, okay, in my local environment, what are the risks that I'm facing? What are the risks that in general are a problem in my local environment? And then how can I create a network that allows, you know, me to manage my risk, um, but also helps others manage their risk um, in a way that helps, you know, the whole region and the whole system be less vulnerable. Um, and then, then I think, you know, there's, um, there, there are a lot of ways that that can scale up. And, and that's kind of, you know, more the second part of the book, but it's really, you know, the first part of the book is kind of like building the basis for, you know, how do we, how do we get to these higher level scale solutions? Um, by, by building on the psychology of how we, you know, manage risk, how we um, deal with stress and how, you know, we've actually evolved to deal with changing environments, you know, because it's something that we faced throughout human history uh, and, you know, fi and figuring out new ways of, of doing things, you know, the ability to innovate, the ability to see new opportunities, to be alert to new threats. That's something that we have a really long history with as humans too. So I think a lot of us are a little bit disempowered from, you know, really embracing those abilities that we have to, you know, deal with change, deal with uncertainty, and be active about managing our risk, um, as opposed to kind of like just going along like, yeah, everything's fine when right. it's only going to be fine if we actually do deal with the situation. Oh, but I, I love denial, though, isn't it? <laughs> oh, man, I love to just... I, 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 I like when I can know that I have like a very serious thing that I need to address in my life and I can just really work toward like, just turning my <laughs> back to it. It's, it's it, I mean, it, it's, it's incredible to me how hard the brain will work to come up with excuses to not just move the body around and, and do a few simple things yeah. to manage things that will make the world or, or an individual's life a, a better place. Yeah. It's, so it's very tricky because yeah. I, I've, I, as you're saying all this, I'm like, I'm thinking, you know, there's, there's all sorts of in every city and town, there's so many, community meetings and things where it, not only you you might think oh well it won't make a difference anyway not only would your presence actually be felt and you would have an opportunity to contribute in most cases but they are desperate to try to get people to come to these things yeah. that are like mostly empty and then they're making decisions mm -hmm. without community input and yeah. involvement and so, so you actually may be able to make more of an impact than you realize. I'm mm -hmm. thinking all this and I'm thinking, I've also never done that. <laughs> I've also never yeah. once just got my body into one of those things mm -hmm. to weigh in because it's, uh, we have busy lives and we have a zillion things going on. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if there's some sort of, um, you know, like, uh, way to okay like i remember talking with someone that was a advocate for eating less meat and things which i'm a meat eater by the way but they had a they had a thing that was like no meat monday you know so they have mm -hmm. here's a zillion reasons why eating less meat is good for you in the world right but that's yeah. hard for people so how about like a little bit of compromise and like a let's make no monday meat monday for people who like meat <laughs> yeah <Right? laughs> <laughs> and, and so, so something like that just, just 
it, just something yeah. that you can personally do. So like, yeah. I'm still going to eat meat, but say every Monday I'm not going mm -hmm. to, or I was raised Catholic and you'd have fish on Fridays or so, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, I, I wonder if there's something like that that you could do in terms of once a month or something like that, setting aside a day yeah. to like, oh, I'm going to think about apocalypse a little bit like maybe how to make my environment and community a little just better and yeah well you know i i have this uh bigger picture goal to yeah. to kind of bring um bring apocalypse prep and apocalypse awareness into people's like minds and hearts through fun mm. So I think that people actually do a lot of things like this already in like festival environments, right? You'll go and you'll like camp and you'll try to, you know, survive just with the tent that you brought and the food that you brought. And sometimes things go kind of wrong and people like are helping each other and getting help. And like there's something kind of fun about that um, because you are, I think, you know, recapitulating these things that, you know, in our ancestral environment, it would have been like, oh, you're like building a good social network. And if you have a need, someone's there to help you. Uh, and so I think that we actually need to like leverage fun and festival type environments and, you know, situations where people feel like they can also, you know, improvise and be creative. And that's the space where, I think we can actually much more effectively shift our lifestyles in a way that is, you know, not just like apocalypse ready in a boring kind of way, but apocalypse ready in a like, you know what, like we can kind of play. We can imagine, you know, these different scenarios. And, you know, if I'm like putting together like my pantry with my, you know, dried beans and rice, like in the back of my mind, there might be like, yeah, you know, in, in the apocalypse, like I could survive on this for, you know, three months, but also it's pretty convenient, like on a night when I'm like, oh, I don't have time to go to the store, but I, Hey, I have all this, you know, dry food here. So you can almost have like your little mini, mini apocalypse Monday where you're like, okay, how do I like take care of my needs with just the preps that I have in my house or, or whatever, you know, so yeah. I think there's a lot of ways that you can actually move your lifestyle in that direction and make it playful and fun. Um, and you know, and the next step after that is kind of like in incorporating that more broadly culturally and the, the book kind of ends with a bunch of suggestions about that. So it'll be exciting to work through those maybe next time we talk. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of people that, that, um, you know, there, there are people that are preppers, um, that, that, you know, they're, they're doing a lot of things that are like this, this is for when crap hits the fan. This mm -hmm. is, I'm, I'm going to build a bunker. I'm going to have all, and then there's people that are just minimalists or just want to live off the grid or mm -hmm. whatever that yeah. are essentially doing the exact same thing, but just for fun, yeah. just, just because they enjoy yeah. like the challenge of it and yeah. everything. And, and, um, that's, that's really, it, that, that's an interest in it as, I mean, as part of why I'm here because I had just put together a festival and as part of when we talked that, yeah. uh, uh, and how we're getting to do this uh, this one episode in person is uh, an aspect of of what I was here to discuss uh, was just how I I had a campout festival right. where people did just that built tents and worked together yeah. and shared food and drink and and uh, and really bonded in a fun. And there was convenience stores 15 minutes away and no one was going to, you know, no one was going to die on us of starvation or anything. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a very fun, safe, benign way to uh, explore what you could do um, right. survival wise if you chose to do that. But yeah. it makes me think next year I am going to have because we also we had, we had glamping and stuff uh -huh. for people. We had like a little yeah. glamping section and people would get RVs and stuff. And I tend to gravitate 
explored that side of things. But next year, I think we'll have like an apocalypse survival area. Oh, where, awesome. We're going to have someone that was going to show people how to build fires. And so I think we're going to oh, focus a little more on that. As you're talking, I'm like, yeah. boy, what a fun way to... Even just have a couple hours of workshops here and there at a festival, and then you can also just go off and see music and hop in a sauna and treat yourself, oh, but at the awesome. same time, learn yeah. a few new life skills. Yeah, and I mean, and the thing is, like, I think a lot of the way that people have approached, like, oh, there's all these problems in the world, is sort of a, like, why aren't you freaked out? You should be freaked out. Yeah. It's so scary, right? And people don't want to listen most people don't want to listen to that they'd rather just like go home and order pizza and you know watch netflix and like feel like oh i should be more scared and then right it, it's not it's not fun mm -hmm. right and so the question is well how do we actually make it fun and i think it's it's not that hard because we humans have fun when we are we're given some like opportunity to be creative, to improvise, to build our skills, to build our social networks um, and doing things like, you know, preparing for the apocalypse, whatever, you know, whatever hazard that is. Right. I mean, there's so many different kinds of hazards that we're facing, um, but having the opportunity to do that where it's fun, it's exploratory, you're, you know, you're you're expanding your own knowledge, you're having the chance to you know, build com community at the same time. I think that that is inherently rewarding for us. And it just kind of shifts our mindsets and our lifestyles in a way that makes it much easier to be like, oh, like, yeah, when I go home, I'm going to make sure that I have, you know, what I would need to shelter in place for 72 hours, because that's a really good general purpose way to be ready in case of many different kinds of emergencies. And, you know, and the fact is if, if everybody had what they needed to be able to shelter in place for 72 hours and be safe, um, when, you know, any kind of disaster happens, that makes it much easier um, to have a collective, you know, response, whether it's, you know, governments or NGOs or whatever for the actual crisis, because you're not dealing with the humanitarian crisis at the same time. Mm. So, you know, there really is sort of a multi-level, multi-layer process here where you kind of, you know, you need to start with making sure that, you know, individuals, all of us and, you know, every individual in our communities like that they have the ability to um, do those things, like be able to, you know, have the resources on hand to, to shelter in place because that then helps the entire community be much more resilient to risk. So, you know, so it's not like I'm saying or, you know, a sort of all hazards approach is saying, hey, it's all on every person to just take care of themselves. No, it's on all of us to make sure that everybody in our communities is able to have that sort of basic level of being able to manage their risk, take care of themselves and their families mm. um, so that all of us can be safer in whatever kind of apocalypse um, we're encountering. Well, the other thing that's that's kind of cool is that as modern humans are so much more specialized than the more generalist hunter gatherers that uh, 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 um, that uh, dominated most of uh, human life for so long is that now people can really find anyone that's watching or listening to this can find their own little way of contributing toward making the world a better place or or um, uh, increasing awareness or helping avoid an apocalypse from people that are that might really like engaging on the community level to the person that's like you know what i want to work for the un that's my goal in life i'm good at managing people not everyone's good at managing people and these high up things not everyone i know I could never be a doctor or a nurse. I just do not have the stomach for like <laughs> blood and guts and, and yeah. things like that. And even though 
if I had the stomach for it, I can't imagine a cooler, more admirable thing. But mm-hmm. but everyone gets to find ways that they can contribute in their yeah in their own way. The the idea that even like being a uh, comedian or a rapper, as we as we saw um, yeah. with Baba Brinkman, uh, with yeah. Baba Brinkman can <laughs> can contribute toward uh, helping yeah get the word out and inform people and in a fun way. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so yeah, I, th- I think that anyone in any position in their life can, uh, figure out ways to in engage, uh, more and in more fun ways. Absolutely. Yeah. And I love that you're going to have like apocalypse survival area at your, Oh man, time. I was, I got a little distracted as you were talking about <laughs> the and stuff. Cause I was like, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, that's what I was going to start planning. That's Sweet. such a, I'm going to be uh, connecting with you to help me plan that a, a little that bit. That sounds so fun. What are we going to be talking about in part two? So in part two, we're going to be talking about the the second half of the book, which is really about, you know, how do we take what we know about our evolved psychology um, and then use that to scale up for dealing with these sort of more um, big picture catastrophic risks that we're facing, you know, and that different kinds of risks than we ever have had to face before. So, so how do we, how do we get there with what we have now? Fantastic. Cannot wait. And thank you listeners and viewers for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll catch you on the next one.